Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so good to be home. My God, my peeps. Man, Rail Base is just, uh, it's just fire. What's happening with that? Man, to have them here is so good. Hey, my parents are here. Mom and dad right here. Yeah, everybody wave. That's pretty cool. No, they didn't come in to hear me preach. I actually told them after they said they were coming, so that's, that's that. Um, it put me, on any, uh, put me on any nation on our globe and partnered me with John Hole. So it's good to see John here. I love him so much. And, and put me anywhere on this, in this country, partnered me with Sorensen. So it's such an honor to, to be a, in this place. Um, what we do in Rebel Base is this kind of quick stretch before the word of God. So we just stand up. We say hello to people that came in late. We do a big stretch. So come on, everyone. We got to do this. The big stretch. Wake yourself up. Say hello to a few people around you. Come on. Greet real quick. Greet. Well, that was pathetic. All right, grab a seat. <laughs> it's supposed to last a lot longer than that. The teenagers go and go and go. It's just pretty cool. Uh, you know, church is community. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you have mom and dad here. Church is community. I mean, one of the things I feel like God's impressed in my heart this morning that I just think is important for our time is church is not informational. It's one of the reasons why um, people that, I know we have an online community and I'm so grateful for technology, um, but, but church at the end of the day is not informational. I mean, if COVID's done anything, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of moved informational things online, which is great. It's one of the greatest tools that we have and people that are on vacation or can't come yet because um, they are just wrestling through the season, job loss, or, or wherever they're at this way, they're able to watch online and you've done that. It's been pretty cool. But what's Amazing about worship at the end of the day, the gathering of God's people, this is not informational. It's not for you to come and receive information. It's the gathering of God's people has been throughout history formational. There's something about being in room with people that's formational. And as great as technology is, it's not the same. I mean, anybody have Thanksgiving on Zoom last year? It wasn't the same <laughs> as grandma's house. I mean, kids, we made them go to online school, but it's, and I know many of you still are, but it's just, it's not the same. When, I mean, gatherings as a whole are formational. Um, it's why when you go to Kyle Field with 108,000 of your friends, it's formational. It's, yeah, it's why you do the cheers and you wear the colors and you learn the liturgy of the place. It's because God created us when we gather together for it to be formational. It's why if you're a kid and you went to Jonas Brothers last Friday night at the pavilion with thousands of other people, the, you leave events like that experiencing something spiritual. When God designed us, he designed us not only for one another, but he also designed us to be in gathering together for formational reasons. This is not you come to sing a song and to receive information. This is you come into the room and the spirit of God over time, week after week, is formative in you. Forms your mind, your heart. Parents being here, I was a confirmation class, age 12, and until now, age 40, I did the math this week. Realized that I've been um, in church 1,500 times since I was 12. Thanks, Mom and Dad, it's pretty cool. And I'm convinced of this. It's when people come up to me and say, hey, how do you know Jesus the way you do? I'm not gonna say, well, with seminary or just like natural leanings towards God, I will say there were 1,500 moments after three decades in the gathering that was formational for me. See, this is important, and we're gonna look at Nehemiah chapter eight, but God designed us to, to be together. And when we're together week after week, that changes us as a people, and it's supposed to change us. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 20, he says, hey, when two or three of you gathered, I'll be there. Or the writer of Hebrews writes in Hebrews, he says, hey, do not stop gathering as some are in the habit of doing so, Hebrews 10, 25. Why? When it's so much easier and more practical to watch online or to do this hybrid thing, why, is it, why, why do we need to wrestle with this now as a church? 
I would say because one, God designed us to be together for formational reasons. In Nehemiah chapter eight, you guys have been going through the story. I get, man, I get such a cool chapter. Um, just look historically with me very briefly. Um, about 1200 BC, this is helpful to know just for you to, when you're reading the Old Testament, about 1200 BC was Moses. And Moses led the people out of Egypt across the Red Sea into the promised land, wandered in the desert for 40 years. He, then Joshua came along, actually brought the people from Mount Bebo into the promised land and began to conquer and establish themselves as a Hebrew people among uh, the place for uh, really until there were 12 tribes that were formed. You guys know the 12 tribes. Then about 1,000 BC, 1,000 years before Christ was the period of the kings. So think Saul, David, Solomon, the period of the kings. That ends up going badly. We get some really bad kings. And then all of a sudden we know it. we've got two kingdoms. We've got the kingdom of Israel to the north, the kingdom of Judah to the south. About 700 BC, the Babylonian army comes, an empire comes in, and the, sorry, the Assyrian empire first comes in at 700 BC, comes in and, and wipes out the kingdom of Israel to the north. And then about the sixth century BC, a new empire comes in, the Babylonians, they come in and take out the lower kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. They send all the exiles of the kingdom of Judah over to Babylon, which was the capital of the Neo-Babylonian empire. It's about 50 miles south of Baghdad, Iraq today. There in Babylon, the exiles lived for over 70 years. The Hebrew people that were a part of the Holy Land, that lived in Jerusalem, that saw that place as the holy place, they were in exile for 70 years. Another empire shows up, the Persian Empire, King Cyrus of the Persian Empire shows up. He basically, Ezra 1 says, was moved to the heart. And so he decides, I'm gonna send Ezra first back to Jerusalem. He can rebuild the temple, tell the people about the law. Then he sends 12, 12 13 years later, scholars believe he sends Nehemiah as governor of Jerusalem he says, you go and why don't you rebuild the wall for security reasons around the town of Jerusalem? And this is the story you guys have been in. The Nehemiah is the governor of this land now. He's the governor of Jerusalem and he has just rebuilt the walls. So you can imagine. Now what's fascinating about Nehemiah chapter eight is we have the accumulation of many events. Number one, we've got the temple rebuilt. Number two, we've got the walls rebuilt. Number three, Ezra's here. He has just completed a first edition or the edition of the Torah. He has brought back the first five books of the Bible together and he's about to read it to the people from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy for the first time in a long time. I mean, people are like, I remember grandma telling me the story about Moses. I remember grandpa telling me the little commandments within Leviticus. This is the first moment that people are all back together about to listen to the word of God. And number four, this is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was the first day of the Jewish calendar, at least the civil calendar. And it was like New Year's Day for us. And so they had, we have New Year's Day with fireworks. They had Feast of Trumpets with 30 trumpet blasts. And they would blast the trumpet 30 times. And then at the end of that, the people would celebrate after repentance. So they would repent of their sins. And on the Feast of Trumpets, they would turn their face towards God is how God designed it. And this is the day of Nehemiah. I mean, can you imagine the accumulation of everything I just said all into one moment? 42,000 people, Nehemiah chapter seven says. It's like half a Kyle field all together in one place. Men, women, and teenagers in the space, anyone that could understand the word of God. So Ezra steps up in front of 42,000. I mean, this room times 100 stands up in front of 42,000 and he opens up the book of God and this is what happens. Ezra, I mean, sorry, Nehemiah chapter eight, verse five. Ezra opened the book. I mean, anticipation in the air. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up and Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted up their hands and responded, amen and amen. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is amazing. The book of God is open. The Torah, the Pentateuch is open before the people of God. And then before he reached Genesis chapter one, verse one, he goes into worship leader mode. He becomes Brenna on the stage. He begins to lift up his heart to God and the people are agreeing with his praises to him. They know when the word of God is opened up, the presence of God shows up. So they're expectant. They're anticipating a meeting with God. 
God is, if God's gonna show up again in history, it's today. When we've rebuilt everything and when we come back together, we, we're gonna worship him in this moment. So there's anticipation in the air. Then what happens next in verse seven, the Levites, and there's a list of 13 names. These are the Levitical priests, instructed the people in the law while they were standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people understood what was being read. Basically, Ezra begins to read from Genesis one all the way to Deuteronomy. He then sends out into the crowd 13 Levitical priests who are giving interpretation. Wait, come here real quick. Who's, who's Aaron again? Wait, come here real quick. Why, why was that command given on that day? These priests' goal was to instruct the thousands. If anybody has questions about the word of God, let me help you and interpret that. So apparently the word of God, not only is there anticipation, now the word of God is bringing revelation. And what happens next? No one expected. You would think we'd all have a big celebration and leave and go to Luby's. That's not what happens. What happens is, verse nine, the Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, teacher of the law, and the Levites who are instructing the people, said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Hey, don't mourn or weep. Wait, what? That came out of nowhere. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So as the word of God is given and read through the story of creation and how God designed, picked a person named Abraham, literally all throughout the story, all the way up into the land of promise, he, we hear the story, but we also hear the commands of God. The people maybe were listening for the first time, hearing the very commands of God. I mean, listen to one of the things they would have heard in Leviticus chapter 26. This is something they would have heard 2,500 years ago on this day. If you follow my commands, God says, and carefully obey, obey what I say, I will look on you with favor and make you increase in numbers, and I'll keep my covenant. I will walk among you, be your God, you will be my people. They're listening, going, this is good. But then verse 14, but if you will not listen to me, and you won't carry out what I've told you to carry out, and if you reject my decrees, abhor my laws, and fail to carry out all my commands and violate my covenant, then I will do this to you, Drum roll, you can feel it. I will bring on sudden terror. <laughs> I'll set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. I mean, can you just imagine 42,000 people going, this is good stuff, wow, this is really good stuff. Oh no, Babylon, these empires. And apparently in the moment, it's not written, apparently in the moment the people are cut to the core of who they are. And they begin to weep and mourn and repent and go, oh my gosh, we have not done. Oh my gosh, we are a sinful people. These are the words of God? Then we don't deserve this God. And they begin to mourn and they begin to weep. And so Nehemiah, Ezra, these priests are good leaders. This is what they say. Verse 10, Nehemiah said, Wait, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Remember, this is the Feast of Trumpets. This is a day when you were supposed to repent before God. This is the day to repent. It's okay if you mourn and weep, but that's not the point. That's not why God has gathered us here. It's just to sit in our brokenness. Don't grieve. I love this. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 11, the Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day, do not grieve. And what happens next is the people all turn their hearts towards God, away from their sin, and apparently there's condemnation at first, then a rededication, and then a celebration, and the people are formed and sent out. What an amazing story in the middle of this. When the people of God gather, there are three stages I believe God wants us to go through every time we gather, you ready? Number one, anticipation. Say it. Anticipation. Two, revelation. Say it. Revelation. And number three, formation. Say it. Formation. Anticipation. When people gather together and expect a meeting with God will then lead to revelation, which is God's word is open to us and get ready. It's active and living. It's gonna say something back to you that it's gonna say something different to you and it's gonna say something over here to you guys. The word of God is not waiting for preachers to bring it to life. It's alive. And so it's ready at any moment for those that have come in anticipation, ready to receive revelation. And then over time, if you do this week in, week out, 1,500 times plus for me, you'll get to formation. You will be changed. And you'll look back and go, I'm not sure what it was. And I'll tell you from heaven's perspective, they're going, I know what it was, is you made the gathering a priority. 
You made this place more than an informational gathering of a good sermon and some songs. This became the family in which I was changed over time. That's what the gathering has supposed to be. That's when God designed you and I to get together. He did not design for you to come in, write down some neat notes, and leave the building. He left for you to come in the building. Spirit of God falls on the people. Word of God opened up. My life is changed, and then I leave changed. Does that make sense? That's supposed to be what this is about. And this is what we're missing in this moment in time. I have three things I want, I think, come from the story of why we gather. If you have notes, my teenagers are so good with this. If you have notes or a note app or something, write it down. If you got a journal, let's go. This is a big moment. I want you to remember these three things. Number one, we gather anticipating a meeting with God. Guys, we don't gather out of obligation to appease him. There is no heaven checklist that goes, this Sunday made it, this Sunday made it. They were busy. Online works this week. Oh, this That's not how it works. God wants to meet with you. We anticipate a meeting with God. I guarantee you, he anticipates a meeting with you. He's leaning in going, are you coming anticipating me this morning? Or is this out of obligation? This has really stirred my heart. I mean, we have just become in a culture, we just show up late in the middle of the second song. We are slammed busy. We are dragging our kids out of bed. One of the last things, the greatest excuse right now is not to be here. It's so much easier online. I get it. But we're missing on the formation. We're missing being in the building with one another. The anticipation of God's going to speak today. So there are practical things I think that can begin to help us. And I want to give you a few. Number one, Hey, go to bed early on Saturday night. I'm serious. Don't stay up and watch them, especially last night. Like, like, like go to bed on Saturday night knowing I need good sleep for tomorrow. Number two, wake up Sunday morning and wake the family up. Drag the kids to church. You're going, Swayze, they don't want to go to church. They don't even want to go to Rebel Base. I'm saying they don't want to go to the dentist. They don't want to eat your salad. They don't want to go to school tomorrow. They don't want to do homework. They don't want to do any of this stuff. But you and I know as adults, what's good for someone is not always what they want. But there is formation that's occurring. So appeasing them every week by saying, okay, sleep in. We'll turn it on the living room, Apple TV, and we'll be fine. All that's teaching them is this is information. Just like school, you can learn online. I'm just saying formation is taking place in the house. And being together in family, anticipating a meeting with God, and experiencing revelation will lead to formation. Number two. We gather to experience revelation. Let me give you, we keep saying the word, I want to give you what revelation is. Write this down. Revelation is the living and active word of God revealing a living and active God. Revelation, this is not a dead text. Revelation is a living and active word revealing a living and active God. So we cannot approach it any differently. I mean, in Ezra's day, this was, there were not Bible, there, it's not like bring your Torah. No, no one has Torah. So when they heard the word of God, they, they approached it with such reverence and worship that when it was open, they go, oh man, he's speaking to me. Are we doing that? Are we anticipating revelation? Revelation is the living and active word of God revealing a living and active God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Anticipation leads to revelation. I watch Mark do this every week. He wrestles with the text. He wrestles night in, night out with the text. He says, Lord of God, this is hard to carry. This is a mantle. He opens it up. He lets it for- formative to his heart. And then he stands up on Sunday. It makes it look so easy. But he then lifts out, gives out to you the word of God that has been spoken. Now raise your hand in the room if there's been a word that's been given in harvest that you felt like was just to you. Yes, that's how God works. It's as if God's going, listen, this thing's gonna speak if you're listening. That is revelation. Living and active word is speaking and revealing a living and active God. Number three, we gather for week by week formation. Wall Street Journal put out an article this week, if you read it on Mondays, by the Infinity Concepts in Gray Matter Research. 
that due to COVID and changes in habits in, Christ, in Christian evangelicals in America, 44% of evangelical Christians plan to return to in-person gatherings. 56% say their new reality is either completely online or a hybrid version, which I get. I mean, it is practical to go online. For those of you watching online, we love you. And it's practical to do this. So, I didn't get to do this last service. I'm doing it this service. I've got practical tips to our online community. You guys have to wait for a second. Practical tips. Number one, for you watching online, set aside 30 minutes before the stream to be still before God. Anticipate God's gonna speak to you today. Number two, when worship starts, turn up the volume. <laughs> Lift up your hands in agreement. I know it's weird and awkward for your husband or your kids or your spouse, but worship, engage, expect. Worship is preparation. It's not only anticipation, it's preparation. It turns your heart from you to God, which is where God wants your eyes before he opens up his word. Number three, as the teaching path, Sorensen opens up the word of God, open up your word from home. Open up, have your Bible open, Nehemiah chapter eight. Have your family sit together, and when the service is over, discuss in questions. This is how we can make anticipation, revelation, and formation work at home, but there is nothing like being in the room. There's nothing like being in the room. Many people have said COVID has killed large gatherings. I would say, hey, go to any college football stadium. <laughs> I say, go to the World Series. Go to the big old Woodlands High CP game this next Friday night. To gather is to be human. To gather with others anywhere is one of the most spiritual experiences you and I can face. We were made to be together. We were made to be in the same space together, being transformed and being changed. That's how God made it. That's how God works. And so for me, I mean, I'm really just wrestling with this. What about our kids and our grandkids? I mean, 1,500 moments has changed who I am. 1,500 Sundays that I don't remember any of the music and some of it was great, some was terrible. Some sermons were amazing, some weren't. But in my 20s, actually teens, when mom and dad brought me to church, there were families that just surrounded me and loved me as a teenager. In my 20s, when I went off to school at Baylor, there were families that adopted Missy and I. When we had a baby, there were people on our row that would hold our kid. In our 30s, when I came to Harvest, I just found home base with this crew. And I realized this was, this is just the family getting together. And the people like the Rogers, I mean, I could just go around the room. Jackie Gill, I mean, I just go around the room. People that have just loved on us over these years. Makes me realize that we are supposed to gather for a reason. And it's the most formational thing that can happen to us. We are supposed to show up on Sunday mornings anticipating a meeting with God. God's in the place scripture promises us. We are then supposed to come to a place of revelation where we go, God, open your word to me today. No matter what you're going through right now in this moment, I, I promise you God hears your prayer and says, let my word speak to whatever situation you're in. And then God's just design. Over time is if we do this week after week, our kids do this week after week. I was talking to a mama after the 930 service who came up to me and she said, my kids didn't wanna to come to one church service. I told them, no matter what, you gotta to come to every uh, service. It's been 20, 30 years now. She says, guess what? They now do the same to their kids. They say, you gotta to go to church. I know you don't want to. I know you'd rather go away this weekend. I said, why did you do that? She says, I don't know, but I don't know who they'd be if I didn't. I know it's easier, guys, but who would you be if you didn't? I know the season right now is just easier to come once a month. And Sorensen, did, these guys didn't know I was gonna preach on this today. I'm just watching my own teen, these teenagers gather, and they're gathering for everything. So I got some hope there, but then I'm looking at adults and parents, and I'm just asking the question, if this is informational, do it online. Let's all do it online. 
But this, if this is formational, then we got to be in the room together. We got to be in community and family together. We got to hold each other's babies. We got to be in each other's lives. Why? Even if it's not for us, let it be for our kids and our grandkids. Jesus, thanks for this morning. I know it's a heavy word. I've wrestled with it all week. But when Nehemiah gathered the people, they came with such anticipation for a meeting with God. They were so cut to the heart with the revelation of God. And they were so formed for years to come because they began to meet. I can't help but think, I don't want to miss that. I want that for my life and my family and my kids and my grandkids. I want formation over time. I want family and community every weekend. I want home. I'm thankful for Harvest that it has become this. A packed room today is a reminder that when we gather together and lift up our hearts and praise, God, you speak every time. You're ready for it. And so, Spirit of God, as we sing this last song, I really hope that we, in many ways, rededicate ourselves and our families to this house, to this community. We recognize that, man, now's the time. If there's ever a time when depression's at the highest, anxiety's at the highest, mental health is at the highest, drugs are at the highest, alcohol abuse is at the highest, our whole community suffering and struggling, what if the answer is just in the gathering? What if we can just get together and encourage one another? Or as Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not stop gathering as some are in the habit of doing so. God, we wanna get out of that habit, back into the habit of gathering. Teach us what formative things happen when your people get back together in the house together, family becomes family, and we anticipate a move of God. Help us to anticipate week after week as we move forward. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.